You want water? Okay. I'll take I'll take one too. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Mayor Dick, I hear you. As you see, I played some music as you entered into the premise. We're trying to do it a little bit different, a little bit more casual. Hopefully you all like Big Band. So I'm going to call to order the Wednesday, May 2nd, uh, board work session. And so I'll look to Connie to go ahead and do roll call. Oh, sorry. Absolutely. Eva Henry. Here. Jeff Baker. Bill Holan. Elise Jones. Deb Gardner. David Beacom. Here. Randy Wheelock. Sean Wood. Chrissy Fanganello. Here. Kevin Flynn. Here. Roger Partridge. Laura Thomas. Ron Engels. Libby Zabo. Tina Francone. Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Bob Roth. Allison Hiltz. Larry Vidham. David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Here. Margot Ramsden, Lynn Baca, Roger Hudson, George Teal, Tammy Maurer, Here. Catherine Hyder, Laura Christman, Here. Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Here. Linda Olson, Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Drew Peterson, Bobby Sindelar, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Henry Eric. Honey, I'm on the WebEx. Yep, I heard you, Lynette. Thank you. Okay. Scott Norquist, Storm Glor, Jim Dale, Paul Hazeman, Ron Rakowski, Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Christine Berg, Dana Gutwine, Jacob LeBure, Jerry Bean, Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod, Kyle Schlachter, Jacob Lofgren, Larry Strock, Wynn Shaw, Here. John Peck, Marsha Martin, Ashley Stolzman, Bob Muckle, Connie Sullivan, Barney Drystadt, Joyce Palazuski, Deborah Jerome, Sean Forey, Chris Larson, Jordan Sowers, Julie Mullica, John Dyack, Josh Rivero, Sally Daigle, Roberta Mooney, Rita Dozal, Mark Lasis, Jessica Sandgren, Jackie Phillips, Herb Atchison, Shannon Bird, Bud Starker, Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Bill Van Meter. Thank you, Connie. Um, next up was the summary of the April 4th, 2018 board work, uh, work session. Is there any corrections, deletions? Updates, seeing none, those will stand approved. Next up is public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the Board of Directors. And I, is there anyone here for public comment? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close the public comment to move on to updates on the Regional Growth Initiative. Brad Colbert. Hi, it's Jessica Sandgren. Hi, Jessica, we got you down. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chair. Glad to be here this afternoon. Uh, so this is going to be um, kind of an update on conversation that actually the board has been having for, for quite some time. Uh, you'll see the clickers around you, so that's kind of your first clue that you're going to uh, be doing polling slides as well. That's going to come a little bit later, and I'll spend some more time uh, describing that exercise as we get a little closer if you haven't um, used those with us uh, before. Um, I, I will just sort of mention for those that maybe have not been uh, as involved over the last uh, maybe year and a half that we've been having this conversation. Um, when the board adopted the MetroVision plan back in January of last year, uh, there was some guidance in the adopted plan that, that really sort of kicked off this process. It said uh, the plan states that, 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 that Dr. Cog and our partners, and, and in many ways that means our member governments, uh, should discuss the best way to have a coordinated conversation around growth and development issues in the region, right? So we, we instantly sort of picked up that conversation uh, after the board adopted the plan, and, and it's been really going, uh, as I mentioned, for, for, for nearly a year or more than a year now. 
Um, so t today we're going to share kind of a pilot uh, program uh, as a proposal uh, to, to the board uh, to, to get some, some feedback uh, from you. Um, I do want to definitely emphasize that I use the word pilot program very specifically. This is not something that we are walking in the door suggesting that this is a 20-year uh, work program. It's something that we would like to try out for the next 12 or 18 months, come back to you at regular check-ins to see if you're getting value um, out, of this, out of this conversation. And when I say value, I mean that as your role as a director. I mean that as your role as a local elected official. I mean that as it, is your staff seeing value of the, out of this, Dr. COG staff on our own will um, also evaluate as to whether we are ultimately um, getting out of this initiative what we really think uh, we want to, to get out of it. Um, we've been working with the board as well as with um, a whole series of stakeholders to co-design this initiative. So what you're seeing today is really the reflection of conversations that we've had uh, with you, um, a, a series of uh, stakeholder uh, conversations, uh, most uh, notably with local government planning staff, and then sort of Dr. Cog's staff's perspective uh, as well. A little bit about what's in your packet. Obviously, there's a memo with kind of a high-level overview of the ground we've covered to date. Uh, the attachment one is the actual sort of proposed um, outline uh, for the Regional Growth Initiative, which I will likely shorten to RGI. And then obviously the staff presentation, which I'll, I'll be walking through right now. Uh, so I noted uh, this timeline a little bit previously. Um, really, as I mentioned, plan adoption in January. We initially sort of wanted to meet with the board a couple of times very early uh, to get some initial guidance. Um, really, these conversations were something along the lines of what would success look like uh, to you as, as, as a director. And that converse, those conversations were very helpful for that sort of second box that you see on the slide. It's we brought together local planning staff. We had a sense as to what your expectations were. Uh, we also talked, you um, gave us some sense as to what roles that you see that make the most sense for both the director, local staff, and, and his uh, Dr. Cog staff. Uh, and then we came back in November uh, and shared kind of a high-level conceptual idea of what this initiative, which is really kind of a portfolio of initiatives, uh, would look like. Uh, one thing that is not on the slide, after November we did a little bit of um, some one-on-one -on -one meetings with, with local government staff to kind of reveal a little bit about what we heard from you in November and just sort of really sort of talk shop about what this should look and feel like um, uh, that would ultimately give comfort to both our local planning partners as well as uh, to Dr. Cog's staff. Uh, so, on the screen now are kind of the four pillars that are kind of the, the basic construct um, of uh, the Regional Growth Initiative. We talked about this in November, so I won't spend a ton of time uh, rehashing that, but high-level feedback from the board are, is kind of on the left-hand side, starting with pillars three and four. Uh, there was a lot of interest in this idea of a cohort-based approach. Uh, I would even say bordering on enthusiasm, which is always good. Um, but, the sort of, the, the comma but, um, some concern um, as to whether this is still a regional conversation. If we have very localized 10, 12, 13 jurisdictions getting together to talk about a shared issue, are we losing the regional um, part of, of the equation? I think that was an important comment that we heard uh, back in November. So, revisiting again some of that conversation just to bring everyone up to speed. Um, Left-hand side of the slide is a little bit about what we heard um, from this group, uh, well, actually the, board, the full board at the regular board meeting back in November, and a little bit about kind of how staff pivoted to, to ultimately make refinements to the proposal that you have uh, in front of you tonight. Uh, the board spent some, a fair amount of time um, talking about the current urban growth boundary, urban growth area program, and really recognizing the historical context of that program with, within the larger conversation about how this region is going to grow and what that means uh, for us as, as, as a region. Uh, so in terms of the, the right-hand side of the slide, kind of how we as staff took that and, and ultimately refined what you see in front of you tonight. Um, we really reflected on the intent of the Urban Growth Boundary Program from the very beginning. We thought about the very core pieces of that program and what it's designed to do, and we wanted to make sure that that, that was absolutely positively present um, in what you see um, in front of you this evening. The UGB is intended to promote plan consistency. Um, we think this proposal does that even more directly in the sense of going directly to your adopted local comprehensive plans and extracting uh, information from that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, sort of this role of translating local growth uh, priorities and commitments uh, to our regional forecast. We think we've done a good job uh, with that as well. And then anticipating uh, the implications of those growth patterns, and I'll, I'll cover that as well. Uh, the one thing that I will mention is uh, we very much want to revisit the Urban Growth Boundary Program part of this um, conversation because one of the things we heard in November was this feels like a, a, an addition to, not a replacement of. 
Um, but that issue itself is so big that we, we wanted to have as much time with you as possible. So I'd really like to really extend that conversation and talk about the role of the Urban Growth Boundary Program uh, within the Regional Growth Initiative at your workshop uh, in August. Um, one of the things that we heard in November was, you know, do your best to strike the right balance between local and regional uh, roles. I will say as we sort of thought through that guidance, uh, we very much as staff focused on um, playing to our strengths in terms of what we can bring to the table. This is a coordinated conversation about growth and development in the region, so we want to absolutely positively, again, play to the strengths of, of, of Dr. Cog's staff um, in, in doing that. Um, we very much, um, at the same time, want to create a more robust feedback loop as part of this program. A lot of the work that we do currently is having very real conversations with your local planning staff about local growth plans and aspirations, feeding it into our work, and there isn't much that comes back to you that's of value. And we need to do a better job of doing that so that you have more and better information that help you um, when you actually sort of go back to your own chambers to make decisions about um, uh, growth and development in your, in your communities. And then I won't spend a ton of uh, time on this slide, but you did uh, commend staff, which we always appreciate, about how much thought and, and effort um, we put into sort of the proposal that you saw back in November. Um, and, and high level, we're ready to get started. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we have every expectation that this is something that is not push the button and we'll come back in a year and a half and tell you how it went. We very much have programmed very real deliverables um, along the way to, to ultimately come back to you to make sure you're getting what you thought you were getting and you can give us feedback and evaluate sort of each of the discrete components um, of this um, going forward. So continuing to check in with you is, is a high priority for us. So I'm going to walk you through um, uh, the work program, this sort of pilot phase um, that we're proposing. Um, it's in the slide deck, but it's also in that attachment one. Attachment one actually has a little bit more detail. So I think you could probably follow along uh, the presentation using, using either one of those. Um, I will also mention that there's some slides in here that we called sidebar slides. Uh, that are really some additional research efforts that we conducted between November of last year and today. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about those, but if you hear something that's of interest, we're happy to come back and share maybe a little bit more detail about what we um, uh, discovered in that. And the other, th the other thing that I'll mention before sort of jumping in is um, I had a few conversations after the packet went out that some of this is hard to follow. It's very conceptual. I totally get that. We still don't even entirely know what the right words are to describe this. Um, we're asking for a little bit of a leash here to, to do the work, come back, and figure out what exactly we want to call this, what is the right terminology. Um, so I will do my best to sort of think about describing this in plain language. Um, I will sort of borrow from our organizational development work that we do internally and describe to you sort of the sensory experience, what should this look and feel like, just to hope help you maybe um, uh, uh, grasp some of this, which again, still lives in kind of a conceptual uh, phase. Um, so in terms of uh, the growth research, pillar one, um, you know, in terms of the growth trends uh, reporting, uh, the slide emphasizes actionable uh, research. I would actually emphasize, if I had to do this all over again, the word provide. Uh, this sort of goes back to what I mentioned uh, before. Um, you know, there's a lot that we do at Dr. Cog that feels internally focused to get our products to the best possible um, in the best possible shape to inform our work as well as the decisions that you make. And we just simply need to do a better job of flipping that a little bit and, and creating more external products. Um, and the idea here is that hopefully these are the types of things um, that that really can ultimately um, be of value to you as you sit here, but also as you um, uh, think about your other assignments as, as local um, elected officials. Um, and the other key thing that I would mention is really that um, the sort of that idea of um, integrating or what, what the influence is of local plans in our, in our forecasting process. Um, unlike some of our peer organizations, Dr. Cog does not have a formal role in uh, reviewing or even approving local comprehensive plans. That is not an unusual role for regional planning organizations in other parts of the country. We don't do that. So therefore, there's not this sort of built-in expectation that we are going to have the best possible information of the status of, of local plans um, throughout the region. So we're just simply committing to do a, a better job of collecting that information and understanding um, how it can ultimately, again, influence 
um, our work as we develop um, long-range uh, forecasts. You know, I'm not suggesting that we are going to sort of change approach and take a tact of uh, providing comments or feedback on local plans. We just simply want to have the best understanding of what's in them, right, so that we can, that we can reflect that in our work and, frankly, ask maybe better questions uh, along the way. Uh, so I mentioned uh, sort of the sidebars. Um, one of the things that we did is we wanted to kind of understand how um, the sort of current batch of local comprehensive plans in our region think about what we were sort of referring to as priority growth areas. Are our local plans identifying these are the parts of our community that we really want to grow in the future? Maybe these are places that we would like to conserve for future growth. Maybe these are places that are more um, about uh, preservation. So we did a scan of a sample of, of local plans, the four kind of that you see on the, on the slider from Longmont, Brighton, Douglas County, and the town of Frederick. And I won't, you probably can't see all the terms, but there are terms that are, that are like municipal service area, growth management area, priority growth area, rural communities, uh, primary urban area, et cetera. These are all places that in local plan, adopted local plans have been described um, that really are of value to us. We, we need to understand your own local aspirations so that we can, again, make sure that our regional assumptions uh, reflect that. And so all of these things can ultimately play in to that coordinated um, and shared understanding of growth aspirations um, around the region. Uh, we view um, kind of the role of the, um, of the regional growth initiative to translate this, right, to translate local work and local priorities into a set of regional uh, uh, planning assumptions. And as I, uh, I, think, I think I failed to mention this, but I have slides each, in each of these sort of work areas to kind of describe your role just to kind of maybe uh, paint that picture for you. Um, you know, like I said, we very much would like to spend uh, a longer period of time with you uh, at your workshop talking about the urban growth boundary um, contributions uh, to the regional growth initiative. Uh, we very much would want the board to help us prioritize and think through um, what research topics make the most sense to ultimately um, put in front of you for future information. Um, we actually have one work product kind of already in the queue that you will see that kind of fits like fits under this pillar. Uh, and that is an overview of how the region is doing on the plan performance measures that were, that were identified uh, in the MetroVision plan. The plan included 16 overall plan performance measures. We anticipate uh, sharing that information with you in the next uh, few months. Uh, and then obviously we, we view, it, view you as someone who will consume this information, ask good questions of us, and hopefully maybe again sort of think through what that might mean um, in your uh, work as local elected officials as well. Uh, so going on to, to, the, to the second uh, uh, pillar, uh, this pillar two, convening conversations and, and information sharing. Um, I view uh, activity 2.1 as really something that we do already, but a, a, a better version of that, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And activity 2.2 is actually something um, somewhat new uh, for our region, and I'll describe that um, as well. Um, so under activity 2.1, uh, labeled that forecast development um, and analysis, uh, that is really us continuing our role um, developing long-term population and, and employment forecasts. That's something that we're federally required to do. It's also an important part um, of our work. Uh, we, we anticipate continuing to do that, particularly the next thing that, that we will be working on, our forecast um, out to the year 2045 uh, in support of the, the next regional transportation plan. Um, the thing that is new and maybe an improvement um, in this work is what we've been calling sort of stress testing. Uh, you could also think of it as scenario analysis. Uh, the basic idea behind that is to um, identify how globally how these set of growth, uh, uh, growth assumptions uh, could really impact uh, the future of the region. I mean, we have planned performance measures. Now that we have this understanding of how we might grow to the year 2045, let's understand and try to um, illustrate uh, and amplify uh, what that means and what are the things we might still need, need to work on. Um, those, by the, in the same uh, vein, uh, we feel like this work could, could ultimately maybe surface some assumptions uh, in our forecasting that might require future action. The best example hypothetical that I could come up with is, let's say the 2045 forecast says that there's going to be 200,000 more people living close to transit um, than there are today. Well, our forecasting approach really relies on sort of macroeconomic forces the local real estate environment and your and local regulations that have been adopted, think zoning um, throughout the region. Well, what happens if under sort of all those constraints, the number is really more like 150,000? 
but local plans and aspirations are more aggressive than that. And that suggests that we need to have a conversation um, as a region is how do we actually make those assumptions become reality. And so we would really like to surface that and ultimately bring those types of issues uh, to you. Um, on activity 2.2, um, this is, like I mentioned, um, a somewhat new role. Uh, we are uh, including a, a more formal sort of acceptance um, of, uh, of that forecast uh, by the Board of Directors. Um, this isn't something that we're expecting you to review every square inch and every assumption that goes into putting together a popping employment forecast to the year 2045, but we do think it's important to have a high-level conversation with you about those assumptions, about the implications, how this might illustrate regional issues that, that the board maybe needs to galvanize around and to maybe elevate in our work and maybe in your shared uh, work programs as well. Could I ask a quick question? <clears throat> in your note there, you say, a shared understanding and acceptance of the region's small area population and employment forecast. What do you mean by small area there? Good question. Um, so we think of our forecasting in kind of two buckets. Um, one is kind of the regional forecasting side. You will sometimes hear us use the term control total. Um, that are, those are conversations that we have with the Department of Local Affairs to come, with, come up with a regional sort of understanding of how the region is going to grow out 25 years. We then have a conversation as what might each county look like, right? So what are the county level control totals? This county is going to grow from 750,000 to 900,000. Small area is, okay, how are those new 150,000 people going to be allocated throughout that county? And so that's really where that, that interaction between the regulatory environment and um, sort of local real estate dynamics come together to help us sort of take our best guess through our model to understand uh, where those folks would ultimately be allocated or placed. And so we have a lot of conversations with your planning staff about those assumptions. They really have a very um, uh, important role in reviewing the results and, and ultimately helping us get to a better understanding of, of where those, uh, those folks would ultimately live and work um, in the future. So the other sidebar that I kind of alluded to, um, probably in the last maybe six weeks or so, uh, we reached out to our, a series of peer organizations from, from around uh, the country to ask, it's sort of a far-ranging uh, survey, but it was mostly about kind of how they develop their forecast, do they take action on it, um, that sort of thing. Um, we ultimately got responses from uh, 11 uh, regional organizations, so to give you an idea of which regions are sort of represented here, you've got Atlanta, you've got Houston, uh, the Bay Area, Kansas City, uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, Philadelphia, Salt Lake City, just to get a sense as to kind of what the state of the practice is um, among our peers. And not really much to Dr. Cog's staff surprise, we are an outlier in the sense that the board does not take any sort of formal action on our regional forecast. Uh, so that was good for us to learn that that's actually general standard operating uh, procedure for our, our peer organizations. Nine of these 11, their board um, does take some action, whether you think of that as acceptance or adoption, whatever the, the best term is, um, of those planning assumptions. So we, we feel like we're, we have some comfort with ultimately making a recommendation that, that the board do that as well as part of um, this uh, initiative. And then again, sort of a slide to kind of highlight um, the board's role. Um, covered most of this uh, previously, but we very much want you to, to, to um, be a consumer of, of that forecasting work, specifically that sort of stress testing. As we learn more about how the region is, gr is going to grow and what sort of pressure points um, that might ultimately reveal, we think you're an important audience for that. And then I sort of mentioned the sort of role of accepting or, or adopting uh, the ultimate and final forecast that becomes our planning assumptions as we go forward into that uh, regional transportation plan. Um, on to pillar three, um, we spent a fair amount of time on this in November, so I'll just I'll really hit some highlights. This is that um, sort of cohort-based uh, approach. Um, I will say activity 3.2, uh, you've actually um, seen before, so I won't spend a ton of time on it. It's really this notion of um, communities coming together that have a shared set of issues or geography uh, to talk about um, um, issues of regional importance together. Um, there was actually a fair amount of enthusiasm about that previously. Uh, activity 3.1 is actually the new item, uh, and talking about that at th um, with the board back in November, uh, we heard 
don't wait on these issues. Like, don't wait for the forecast to reveal something. Don't necessarily wait for the, the growth research to re reveal something. Let's be proactive. If there's something out there we, that we know is absolutely critical uh, to our work, if there is a way to go ahead and um, begin to formulate uh, and, and form uh, cohorts, uh, go ahead and do that. Um, and again, sort of referring to, to the board's role here um, on that particular topic, again, we would very much love it if you could help us identify and prioritize what these topics um, might look like. Uh, and just as importantly, if you're, as you're having the conversation around this table about what issues are important to the region, if that resonates with you locally, we would love it if you sort of volunteered your, um, uh, your community to ultimately uh, participate um, in that conversation. Um, Kind of one aside here on the cohorts, sort of we've independently we have kind of a few things kind of bubbling up of uh, folks that have proposed cohorts to us um, that really I don't think the folks that I'm hearing from had any idea this was coming down the pike. Uh, so it's just nice for us to know that there is kind of a market or potentially some demand for this um, type of conversation. So there's actually some things bubbling up that to me suggest that we won't, we won't have to necessarily make an ask. There's actually some folks interested in having conversations that feel very similar uh, to what's been described in the proposal. And then uh, lastly, the, the, the fourth pillar, this uh, commitment to service. Um, as I noted back in November, this in some ways um, is the easiest to describe. This is just almost exclusively the domain of Dr. Cogstaff. Uh, the way that we view this is if our board, you, um, our planning partners at the local level um, are committed to, to items or issues and pillars one through three, it's our job to figure out how we can support those conversations, right? Whether that, whether that is through facilitating cohort-based conversations or whether that is uh, creating new data tools and information to support uh, both regional and local um, conversations about growth, that, that's our job. Uh, to, to, to again understand what the what the requests are and to ultimately uh, respond to that in our work program and then again and sort of again to sort of describe and walk you through um, kind of your role as, as directors um, you know we hope that as, as a cohort meets concludes their work share has findings to share we would want to bring that um, back to you uh, and then obviously we always anytime we develop a tool a set of data anything at Dr. Cog, we always think of you as directors as actual users. I mean, you're, you're an audience that we consider um, as we design tools um, and, and data strategies. So at minimum, we think of you as users, but we would certainly love it for you to at least also be um, champions as well so that your community could, could potentially use uh, tools and data sets that are developed as, as part of this work. So with that, I'm going to transition over to kind of the polling discussion um, side of this, but I'm happy to pause and answer Im any immediate questions that come to mind. Real quick, can I ask, is anyone else joined online with us? It was Lynette, and there's two, one more. No, there's two more joined. Libby Zabo's on here. Hi, Libby. Hi, Libby. Hello. And who else? And I believe you can participate online with us on this next exercise, right? There is a way for them. Okay. Yep. I'll describe that. I think we had a couple. One more you. question for you. Uh, so you mentioned at the beginning that we'd have further conversations about the urban growth boundary. So the idea then is to reinstitute that in some form, or I'm unclear how that might interact with the, this RGI thing that we're talking about today. I, 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 don't, I don't know if we have intent. We, I think the intent here is to sort of share with you maybe some observations of the first couple of months of what we're doing as part of the RGI, how that pairs, doesn't pair with the existing program, and to frankly maybe troubleshoot with you a little bit as to how we can continue to have what the board surfaced in November is an, an important conversation about sort of how this region um, grows outward and what that means in terms of um, need for services and impacts um, on the region. So I, I honestly don't have sort of the, the magic answer that's exactly what we're going to talk about in, in August. What I simply want to do is maybe spend a few months, get my head around kind of what particularly the forecasting work is going to look like and so that I could have, uh, we can have a, a, a conversation in August about how UGB fits in within the other work that we've started. Okay, thanks. And the, but the the UGB program, it, it, if I understand correctly, it's it, it's inactive right now, right? I mean, like we're not doing that allocation stuff at the moment, right? 
Uh, we have a, it is, I wouldn't call it necessarily inactive. Um, the board, um, a couple of things. The, the board took action in 2013 to delay that allocate, the, the allocation process that would have been associated with the last MetroVision plan. Um, at the same time, the board had a lot of dialogue um, during the development of the MetroVision plan that, that ultimately resulted in the UGB being sort of withdrawn from plan language. Um, it talks about those issues, but does not necessarily name that program specifically. So it ultimately gave us the charge to think through initiatives that would ultimately carry on that conversation, potentially including the UGB, potentially not including the UGB. And so we have sort of marched forward with an overall thinking of this regional growth initiative and sort of put a pin in the urban growth boundary program until we can get a better handle of what's the other stuff uh, that we're talking about here. And then again, we'll come back to you in August to maybe have a little more framed uh, conversation ab about that. Okay. Thank you. Director Begum. Could you clarify just as a, uh, so I have the same concept that I think everybody else is working off of. What is exactly is our definition or our assumption of what a cohort is or should be? Sure. So we generally think of cohorts as either being, and, and this is our narrow definition, sort of topically based or geographically based, right? And so these may be communities that um, are all, because of geography, have uh, new to borrow the transit station have new transit stations, but are dealing with first and final mile connectivity um, and connections to those station areas, right? So that's really both an issue that's also based in uh, geography, or they could be topically based. It could be um, uh, communities that maybe are uh, sort of on the that are transitioning from more rural land uses to more urban land uses that are trying to sort through like how to actually go through that that process. Director, sure. Director Christman. Well, you know, this is one of my issues is open space and trails. Um, I would think it would be helpful for communities to have some agreement, since we've already identified we want connectivity uh, on trails, we want people to have access to parks and connectivity to parks and open space, but I don't think. <clears throat> I, as I recall, like a uh, cemetery can be an open space. And, you know, I don't really think we need a lot of technic. Maybe we do. Uh, but as we design the growth or look at the growth, I think we do need some cons consistency as to uh, what kind of co connectivity we want. Is it a share row, which is just like taking your life in your hands? <laughs> um, or is it a, you know, a designated on-road trail is a designated off-road trail um, you know how are we going to create what we think is beneficial and how can we at least be talking about the same things so is is that sure so I'll, I'll give you um, and my and as I've sort of walked you through this evening and in previous conversations I, I've been very much if I haven't said it I hope you've made the connection I've been talking about our work program is Dr. Cog. Like, what can we do on these issues in service uh, to our members? Have not spent a lot of time talking about things that we can do where we are actually more in a partnership arrangement. Um, so your issue is, is one of those. Um, I am currently serving on the interim steering committee of the Metro Denver Nature Alliance, which is a brand new um, nonprofit uh, in the region that is, that is forming just to have that issue um, surfaced uh, throughout the region. How can we build on our natural amenities and our, and our recreational amenities and create the, the highest degree of access um, throughout the region um, on those issues? They have two primary work program items that have been identified. The second one is um, a regional vision for parks, open space, and conservation, and how we, again, take advantage, uh, advantage of the resources that we have. Uh, and so those are the types of things that we slot in, but they're more on the partnership side of things versus maybe us as Dr. Cog convening the conversation or facilitating uh, the work in some way. But we are definitely active partners in that. Any other questions online or in the room? Okay, good, Brent. So we are, this is when the clickers come in. So if you do not have a clicker, wave your hand wildly. If you are online, I'll explain how you can participate so that you are not, not included um, in this conversation. Um, 
as a reminder, this is obviously not a formal or binding vote. Uh, this, can, this group does not actually take action during work sessions, so that wouldn't be appropriate um, anyway. Um, as I noted earlier, th these questions that you're going to see in front of you this evening really build off some previous conversations. I won't get, I won't revisit this too much, but in May of last year, we asked you, how would you actually evaluate what we're kind of talking about in broad terms? We're now circling back with a little bit more detail and asking you a pretty similar set um, of questions. Um, so really, it's, you know, you talked about expectations and roles uh, uh, back in May. Um, in terms, so you, you, I will come back to the people online when we have a slide of that. It'll be easier to, to talk to. So, um, as we oftentimes do with these, we are going to put up um, a test question so that you can make sure your 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 clicker is working. There we go. Um, so our warm up question: Is your jurisdiction registered for the Bike to Work Day Business Challenge? You'll see on your keypad one, two, and three. If the answer, your answer is yes, hit one. If it's two, no. Three for not sure. Hmm? Don't worry. Online, I'll explain it to you in the next one. Don't, don't worry about this. Thank you, Andy. So we'll go ahead and review these results. Uh, so all, seven, yay. Uh, if, if you are a no or not sure, um, you can absolutely positively talk to Celeste. Celeste, wave, wave your hand. Yep. Yes. And then I also say if you're shy and you don't want to talk to Celeste, if you actually Google or your favorite internet, internet search engine, Bike to Work Day Business Challenge, it's the first thing that pops up. So if you can't catch Celeste today, some other time would be fine. Okay, so this is when I'll explain, just, I will pause on this for a second to explain the slides and a few other things. Um, if you are participating remotely, um, you can basically type in uh, the chat box, your answer, one, two, three, or four, and we have folks here that will ultimately account for uh, your vote. So you are, you are not disenfranchised um, in this conversation. So uh, the next two polling slides kind of focus on um, regional benefit and local benefit, which are things that we talked about um, back in uh, last May. I will tell you that we are asking things on a four-point scale. Uh, that's because Jerry Stiegel, our Director of Organizational Development, has just bluntly over and over and over again talked to us about the importance of a four-point scale. It means if you're leaning towards agree or disagree, you have to choose. You can't pick um, kind of a neutral option, which sometimes people um, tend to want to do. Um, I also understand that, that you may not know enough right now to vote. Like you're just not quite sure you actually would prefer to just abstain. Normally when we track these, we actually calculate percentages, but today we're actually calculating raw total number of votes. So that will at least give staff an idea of, okay, we've got 20 people in the room, but only 12 voted. That suggests eight just weren't sure enough how to vote. So that tells us we still have some work to do. That's, that's some data points um, for us um, as well. Um, so again, I'll, I will read uh, the question at the top of the slide, and then one, two, three, or four, strongly disagree to strongly agree. Uh, regionally, this initiative will help us maximize the benefits of growth and minimize potential negative effects. And again, if you're online, you can um, uh, type it into your chat uh, feature, and we'll have staff here that will that will enter your um, enter your vote. I'm going to call it good. So we got an agree there, and we're going to come, come back to this um, in a second. So we're going to sort of come through the, all of these, and then we'll come back and discuss them uh, kind of collectively. So hopefully it'll pick, we'll pick up steam here now because uh, you've, you've been through this. So, again, this is more on the local side of things. So locally, this initiative, uh, as described in this proposal, will help us prepare for longer-term growth and its potential impacts. This was something that was identified in, in May as sort of a hope or expectation of this program uh, for the board. I'll go ahead and enter here. Similar uh, to the to the previous. Are you keep? Are you okay? Cool. Um, next, uh, we talked in May about sort of roles for for both Dr. Cox staff and as you as director. So we've got a couple of questions related to that. 
So how strongly do you agree or disagree that this initiative will allow Dr. Cox staff uh, to serve as facilitators? That was a word that you really gravitated to when we talked about this uh, last year. Okay, well, I think we'll call it good. More, again, a strong showing of agrees. Another set of uh, words that resonated with the board last time in terms of the role of uh, Dr. Cog staff was uh, serving as analysts and modelers. So the question is, how strongly do you agree or disagree that this initiative will allow Dr. Cog staff to serve as, as analysts and, and modelers? We're good on this one. All on the right-hand side, that's good. Uh, so we also talked in May about sort of roles as, as the Dr. Cog board and how that, how, what, roles, what words would describe your role um, as an individual director. The number one choice was actually representative, which I think is pretty self-explanatory. But number two and three were clearly separated from the other choices, and those were the words uh, uh, prioritizer and balancer, which I understand are kind of fuzzy words. Based on a year's worth of dialogue on this topic, I tend to think of prioritizer meaning prioritizing issues that, that Dr. Cog um, works on and potentially even prioritizing investments. And then I think a balancer is sort of balancing your role as a regional director, but also um, getting value as, as a local elected official as well and hopefully getting uh, value in both of those uh, roles. Okay, we're going to go to the next final set. So again, a lot in the agree category. Uh, the last, we've got two more polling slides. Uh, they are really about surfacing the language as it appears in the MetroVision plan. I mean, that, that's what we're chasing here uh, to some degree, so I just want to surface that. These are also things that were talked about um, last May, so I want to get some sort of instant reaction uh, on those questions as well. So how strongly do you agree or disagree that this initiative will help new urban development occur in an orderly and compact pattern? I think we'll go on to the final polling slide. It's a little more mixed um, on that one. So again, last uh, polling slide. How strongly do you agree, disagree, that this initiative will improve growth priority coordination and designation between Dr. Cog and local communities? Okay, I think we can call this. So that concludes the polling part of the presentation. We really are going to try to amp up our game here and let you see all these results together. And my colleague Andy says we're good to go on that. This is when staff cl crosses their collective fingers. So. What we have prompts on the slide, uh, or this is now an Excel sheet, um, that really were kind of the three discussion questions that we threw out in the memo. Clearly, it's your purview as to what you want to talk about based on what you've seen uh, uh, this afternoon. You can see each of those uh, statements that we asked you to vote on and, and generally kind of where they uh, were oriented from a mean score uh, perspective. If there's anything that you specifically want to talk about, about um, why did you score something a certain way, um, if there are things that you feel like are missing from this pilot phase that you think are important to surface uh, with, your, with your peers and with staff, please do that. And then obviously this is a good time to talk about uh, concerns uh, as well. So with that, I'm happy to answer questions and or uh, let you all discuss.
Any questions or discussion? Anyone on the phone? Anyone in the room? Director Elrod? It was a toss up between you and Brockett. So looking at some of this, you know, the ones that scored extremely high, especially the modelers and analysts, I, you know, I think that was an easy one and really where the strength is of what Dr. Cog does. I was hoping that the first one would um, be stronger. So I think that's an important one that we need to work on because if we don't maximize the benefits and minimize the effects, I mean, at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do is to ensure that we're maximizing the benefits and minimi minimizing the negative effects. So I think this is one that we have to feel really confident we're able to accomplish. Otherwise, not sure why we're doing it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Director Brockett. Yeah, Director Elrod, that was well said. I, I think that the strengths of what you're proposing as I see it is there's a lot of really good information gathering and sharing information and analysis. Those seem like real strengths of the things that you're proposing. But I don't see any attempt to guide or shape the direction that we might proceed in. And I think that's to your point and I think that's why the things that we're scoring lower were about are we maximizing benefits, minimizing negative effects, are we helping development occur in an orderly compact pattern? Because I didn't see that coming out of what you're proposing. I don't see ways that it's improving things. It's really just talking about what is happening and what might happen. So I, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to change that, but that seems to me to be missing. And I'll quickly respond to both of that. I understand I'm asking you to evaluate something that are just words on a page and sort of this construct and concept right now. But I think what we've heard from you consistently is important for us to, to understand, right? As we, as this becomes more real and there are more products and deliverables, I think they will ultimately inform that exact type of conversation. But I think we've got to get to the sort of information side of things first to have the best version of a conversation about what what that means, what what direction does that uh, take us to from an from an action standpoint. That's at least the way that we've been thinking about this. So. Director Fanganello. Well, it, you, you just stole my thunder, actually, because I was going to say that I think what's most important about this is the information. And looking at, you know, where we do have the high scores is that we, it, it seems as though we see that this is a place where we can bring more information that can help you guys facilitate, that can help us analyze and model things differently for us to make decisions. And, and I think without having that in front of us, it's hard for us to kind of say how the other ones are going to go. So I think that we've got higher scores on 23 and 24 is really important and, and positive because I think people see the potential that this tool might bring and, and then how we choose to use it moving forward is, is a whole, that's a whole other thing. Director uh, Crispin. I know I'm going to get blamed for being an attorney and <laughs> wordsmithing, but it was the maximize and minimize language that bothered me because you almost need a crystal ball. Hindsight's always 2020 to figure out what are the maximum benefits and the minimum. For, so for me, re, if it were to read regionally, this in initiative will help us identify the benefits of growth and identify potential negative effects. That sounds like what we'd be doing. I don't know that any of us can figure out what is the maximum benefit or the minimum negative. Director Shaw. Thank you. Um, I actually wanted to build uh, a little bit on, on some of the other comments because I, I do think to the extent that if there's analysis, forecasting, modeling, facilitating, um, that most of us will come to a good conclusion um, w without any, you know, external forces. So it allows the local governments to make decisions and to try and help those be a, a productive part of the, the big area um, vision, goals, outcomes. 
so I, I, I do think that part is positive. I like, um, Director Chrisman, from your point of view that, uh, you know, even trying to draw that more strongly, um, encouraging and, and uh, helping us draw the conclusions might, might be valuable as well. Thank you, Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I'd like to um, reinforce a bit what we heard from Director Fanganello in that, you know, um, and Brad, by all means, correct me if I'm completely wrong on this, but this harkens back to a conversation we had uh, back in the good old uh, MVIC committee um, going several years back, Bob, and mm -hmm. I think you, you, it's worth the discussion we had of should the role of Dr. Cog be the police station or the university? And so, I mean, I think, it, it, just as the director mentioned, that, you know, we have a good score going with 23 and 24, I think because that is definitely where we all share the same values about we want to be more the university. We want to be the place where we have that repository of knowledge, where we are doing that analysis, and it becomes the, the think tank, if you will, for the region. So, uh, and I think the scoring uh, shows that very clearly. So, perhaps that's where the initial en emphasis must go. And then as we start building that knowledge base and we start building that information pool, from there we can start exploring further out um, what some of these other questions did touch on, but obviously don't share quite the same, um, you know, concurrence among everyone. Any questions or comments online? Okay, seeing none, I, I just have just one, one comment is on 27. Um, coordination between Dr. Cog and local communities. Uh, I, I think it should also be even amongst other communities that are neighboring. Um, I mean, the live situation for Arvada is we are, our growth boundaries between us and Wheat Ridge have been in confusion stage for a while, and we have to now create an IGA just so we're clear on our horse tooth borders. Um, so when I look at that particular number 27, I, I think there's a role that Dr. Cog can help facilitate. I know it's a neighbor. Um, but to make sure we're all on the same page because even our land use was way out of uh, alignment to our neighbor. They were doing low density, we were doing high density, and it was dramatically different. Um, so when we look at growth, you know, it's, I think it's important when we start butting up against each other and how we make uh, cohesive neighborhoods. So anyways. And I'll just add that as, as Dr. Cogstaff, we have viewed that as a very potential value that could come out of this, and we've also heard that from our um, uh, local planning partners as well. I just haven't surfaced as much in the, in the presentation, but we see that for sure as being a benefit. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. No, I, I appreciate that, com that comment, Chairman. I, I, um, I agree with you, and I think that's part of the benefit of this whole co cohort ex idea, right, this concept would be, you know, I just think, I'm, I'm, personally, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with this, this approach. Um, I've, you know, I've gotten a little more little more background than you all have with this when I'm talking to staff and all. So, I mean, I, I, I understand that this is all relatively new for you all. But I think what we've done in the past is that, you know, we developed this long-range regional transportation, or not even transportation plan, metro vision plan. And um, as staff, we kind of stop short, right, as what the next step is. We give it to you and, like, good luck. And I think that what this is trying to accomplish is to be more proactive and interface more with your staffs and your communities to provide examples and, and possible solutions, right? So this research side, and I appreciate that metaphor. I'm, you, you've, I'm, I, was, I was thinking, God, I wish George was here earlier because there, there was that metaphor that you used, and I think it's perfect, right? Because it's, it is it's part research institute, university. And then the opportunity then, once we associate, you know, these, these issues, are there, are there cohorts of communities that would like to work together on that? So, for example, uh, workforce housing. I mean, I don't, probably don't know, have, need research to know that we have an issue with workforce housing. But we isolate in certain areas of our region where it is significantly low. Are the communities within that area willing to work together? Right, it gets back to your original comment to have that discussion about how we can 
build that up to an, an acceptable level, for example. Um, so, you know, so issues like that. So I think it, it really truly is, and we've really searched and tried to find opportunities to interface more with your staffs and all, and hopefully this will do it. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited, actually, about, about the, uh, the pilot portion of this. And I'll add one thing that uh, it's a word that actually Director Dyack said, I don't know, a year ago, was consultative, and that that word has really resonated with us. And just one sort of very specific example that's less about cohorts and more direct communication and coordination between Dr. Cog and, and member governments. Um, we've had some member governments that have been working on comprehensive plans that have reached out to us very early to say, what actual population and employment estimates should we use as the foundational assumptions for what we're planning for, right? Oftentimes we see that stuff at the very end. So we've done a little bit of that already. And frankly, in a kind of a round of uh, sort of ad hoc um, uh, stakeholder engagement we've, that we've done earlier this year, we've had more communities say to us, well, we wish we would have done that. We should have thought to find out based on the tools and the, and the, and the data that you have, is our, is our future number 300,000 or is it 260,000? Because that changes um, dramatically what they are going to plan for, what sort of land use patterns, what types of growth and development um, issues that they expect to ultimately respond to um, in their planning framework. So we, we hope that this ultimately results in more conversations like that. Yes, uh, Director Maurer. Um, I was just, I kind of got caught up on um, 25 when it was talking about prioritizers and balancers. So, so I, I'm thinking that it, we're, we're gathering the data from our plans and so forth, and, and you know, you do the analyzing and so forth. And then we look at that as a board and say that, you know, that's what we're going to prioritize or no, maybe we need to balance. I, I guess to me that was action words and I didn't kind of gather that that's what this was. Yeah, I, I'll take another stab at that. Like, I can't remember, um, Director Maurer, if you were here for that conversation uh, back uh, last year. We put up, I think, 10 words to describe the potential role for the for board of directors um, in this conversation, and, and some of them were pretty easy words to define and recognize. Those two were pretty hard, um, and they ultimately were something that, that people gravitated to, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure there was sort of a clear, accepted definition of what they meant uh, from folks around the table that were voting, but as I mentioned um, earlier in my presentation, just based on a year's worth of conversation, to me, prioritizer at least serves two functions. Um, it is uh, prioritizing our work, hearing what comes out of this, and telling me, like, it feel, this feels like something that Dr. Cog needs to work on. Cool, you've prioritized and said, maybe this is an issue that we, have, we as an organization have maybe not been front and center on. You're suggesting that maybe we should be. That's great. There could also be some prioritization when it comes to um, uh, funding and resource investments. That's clearly a decision um, that you need to make, but you will have better information about um, growth and development, uh, trends and dynamics in the region that might, again, take you down um, that path. On the balancer side, it's really, it's a, I, we have heard pretty consistently this idea that this ought to be of maximum value to your role as a regional director and your role as a local elected official. And so I'm, I'm, that is sort of the holy grail for me is that I am producing stuff that you eat up and love to hear about um, as you sit around the board table here, but that you also call me uh, on Thursday and say, what was that thing that you talked about? I really would like to have a conversation with council about this because it is sort of this bigger macro issue that is happening in the region that we in Centennial need to sort through and grapple with um, on our own. So that, that's my hope as to what uh, the board has emphasized in giving um, us direction as to what you see as your role in this. Any other questions? All right, seeing none. Thank you for your patience. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Brad. Next up, we have uh, <clears throat> the discussion of outstanding topics for incorporation into the draft of 2020-2023 TIP policy document. Mr. Ron Papsdorf, you're up. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, good to be here this afternoon. Um, today's discussion, I want to talk a little, give you a little bit of an update on kind of where we are so far in establishing the policy for the 2020 to 23 TIP. Um, this new experiment we're all collectively working our way through that has a regional component and a sub-regional component. Um, the remaining schedule that we anticipate to complete the TIP policy and allow us to move into the first 
uh, regional call for projects and then the sub-regional call for projects and then really seek your feedback on um, three of the kind of key outstanding policy issues and the three that we'll talk about uh, this afternoon aren't necessarily all of the poly policy issues that were remaining that are remaining to be wrestled through but want to give you leaders are some some meaty ones so we want to get that conversation started with you today so as I um, alluded to, uh, we feel like we've made significant progress um, with you over the last seven months or so. Um, you have, in August, established the TIP set asides, um, identified the TIP focus areas in September of last year, um, uh, endorsed the regional share eligibility um, early this year, um, settled on the funding split between the regional share and the sub-regional share also in January. Um, identified the sub-regional forum governance structure in February and then most recently um, last month now in April um, established the regional share criteria and the approval process for the regional share uh, projects uh, recommendation process. So what we have remaining to do um, through uh, this spring and into the summer is uh, working with the TIP policy work group um, on their remaining meetings. I think I've heard that they've met 40 some 40 times so far. We're hoping that over the course of four more meetings with that group, uh, we can work uh, forward to getting uh, finalization of the TIP policy document to guide this process. Uh, we'll we'll be back to the T Transportation Advisory Committee as well as the Regional Transportation Committee and the Board of Directors with some incremental um, uh, issue updates in May. Uh, and then finally, uh, aiming towards bringing a final TIP policy document forward for approval in July meetings of the TAC, the RTC, and ultimately the Board of Directors. So that's what you have to look forward to. So um, kind of the, the three sort of policy areas we'd like to discuss this afternoon um, with you and, get, and seek your feedback on initially are the sub-regional share criteria, so following on the previous conversation we've had around this, the regional share criteria, um, the app, the, some uh, discussion on potential limits on the number of applications to be submitted in the sub-regional share process, and then talk about um, how we deal with any consequences for um, sponsors of projects that are in second year delay. So on the sub-regional share criteria, uh, based on some initial um, staff conversations as well as conversation with the TIP policy work group, um, we're, um, we've identified uh, giving each of the sub-regional forums uh, an option of three processes to use for the sub-regional share criteria. One would be to use the regional share criteria that you have endorsed as is. Uh, second option would be to use that, that regional share criteria with some alternative scoring or weighting system uh, as the sub-regional forum deemed appropriate for that sub-region. And then the third option would be to really create your own criteria by sub-regional forum uh, criteria and scoring system, though we believe it's important to have some acknowledgement of the Metro Vision um, components in the regional share criteria. So that would be the TIP focus areas that the board has adopted, the transportation focused Metro Vision objectives uh, from the regional share criteria, and then really at least the th answering the three questions from part one of the regional criteria, which is the why is the proposed project important? How will that proposed project address um, the specific transportation problem that's stated in part one, and then how will connectivity to different travel modes be improved? Our goal uh, with this process is to really provide the sub-regional forums flexibility to address local priorities. Uh, we think that was the intent of having the regional and the sub-regional uh, components this TIP cycle, but with inappropriate sideboards, because ultimately, collectively, what we're trying to do is implement the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. So having some sideboards uh, around the flexibility allowed to the sub-regional forums is the intent here. Um, I think the initial conversation at the TIP policy work group was uh, general agreement that um, the regional criteria was the right place to start and allowing some flexibilities for the sub-regional forums to um, adapt that regional criteria to their circumstances was appropriate. 
So with that, I'll take a pause and um, kind of maybe ad ad uh, ad address each of these policy issues one by one as we move forward. Any questions, comments? Polling. I didn't set this up for Director L. Rod. My own. So we've modeled this uh, through studying other areas that have done this. How, what recommendations or what have we seen from those other areas? Which approach do they take? Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, Director Elrod. So my understanding is that Puget Sound is sort of the model for this, and they generally uh, kind of have the, uh, a broad regional framework and then allow their subregions to adapt that. So was it a B or a C? Um, kind of the B option. Mm -hmm. And, and we're suggesting allowing the subregional forums to select any of these three. So we're not we're not asking the board to adopt one of these approaches. We're we're suggesting that each of the subregions could select from any of these three options. Uh, just real quick, uh, Doug. No, I, I just follow up on that, and and that is correct. You know, we are you know kind of using that template of Puget Sound Regional Council, and and um, they quite frankly, Todd, correct me if I'm wrong, do offer quite frankly, these three options. It, this is consistent with Puget Sound. Um, I know there's, they have four counties, four subregions, two of which I believe use the regional criteria. One um, is, is slightly modified from the regional share, and I think one, actually, there is some modifications. You know, yeah, yeah, so. Director Jones. Um, you know, I think generally this is headed in the right direction to have some balance you know, where subregions can put their stamp on it based on their, you know, local needs. But, you know, as the Metro, Metro Vision, you know, champion, I guess I would want to make sure that um, no subregion could get too far away. So everybody gets to choose their weighting, but you can choose that we really meet Metro Vision or we just meet it a little bit. And, it, and hopefully there's some sidebars on this or staff guidance I mean God forbid that somebody choose criteria that are actually counter to Metro Vision goals like choosing transportation solutions that increase single occupancy vehicle use you know so I guess I appreciate the flexibility and I understand that's the direction this group is headed but I guess I would like to have some sense of what what are the sidebars to make sure that we stay pretty close to on track with heading towards our Metro Vision I have Director Teal and then Director Rakowski. I'm about to agree with you again. <laughs> it's a moment. Don't tell anyone. It's a moment down there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she got this on video, right? Um, so in Douglas County, we've, we've had an opportunity to, to really uh, get into this in our last meeting. And I think we have real concerns uh, in terms of Douglas County of adopting version C. We'd have real concerns, um, quite frankly, I, and, and when, of course, kick me if I go way off track here, but you know, we have concerns about writing the criteria from scratch, even with the idea of having the handlebars. And so I think we, uh, our discussions are, are kind of going more towards uh, option B, of going ahead and certainly changing weightings because I, I think you know we can all look around the table and see communities that, you know, uh, you know, Chrissy, Kevin, sorry, our priorities in Castle Rock are probably going to be a little bit different than Metro Denver, you know. So uh, that we have given ourselves that capability with the subregional split, but at the same token, I think uh, uh, our thoughts in Douglas County and what I would encourage us to do here. Um, when we meet as a board, would be to go with more of an option B. Allow waiting to change, but really stay within the spirit, stay within the scoring or the criteria categories of the regional tip. Director Rukowski. I would remind my favorite Boulder County Commissioner <laughs> that ultimately anything the sub-regional counties do has to come back to this board for approval. That's your safety bell and check. Thank you, Director Rakowski. Director Atchison. 
just the, the one thing I would ask you to consider in this is you start to look at using number two. Whatever criteria you decide you're going to come up with, if you decide to go that route, you're going to have to stand up to scrutiny not only from the overall board, but we may also have the federal level highway, uh, trans highway fund to also look at that to make sure that you're all fair and equitable. So you're going to have to be able to explain why you chose what you did in probably some excruciating detail if you're going to deviate much from what's being uh, provided by Dr. Cobb. So just be prepared. You're going to may have to do a lot more work in order to sell your criteria than if you go along with what's either in number one or number uh, A or C. Director Teal. Hey, and just to, just to, uh, I mean, it just occurred to me, um, based on Herb's comments, you know, uh, we're experimenting here. You know, I mean, uh, we had a lot of discussion when we were deciding to go with the regional, sub-regional split and what that would look like. Um, obviously, a lot of you remember my comments there, you know, how I wanted to vote. But I think we do need to respect the fact that we did have many, many members who really had real concerns that we were going to go, you know, this was going to be crazy. This is going to be an experiment. And that the feds indeed were going to voice their displeasure in some arcane, odd manner uh, uh, with our plan. So, again, you know, uh, uh, again, as, as like the other folks who have spoken in favor of option B there, um, option C, maybe not this time around. But we will have another tip cycle in the future so long as uh, Jesus doesn't come and call us all home. Maybe then we can have an opportunity to go a little more creative with option C. Uh, Mr. Papsdorf and then uh, Director Brockett. Uh, you can let the director okay. go. Director sure. Brockett. Thank you. I'm going to agree with Director Teal as well. I mean, I think that C could go a little uh, too far afield. Um, I think the idea of being allowing uh, subregions to pick their own weighting makes sense. M maybe, maybe within sidebars. I mean, maybe you can't assign zero percent to every criteria except for one. <laughs> you know, um, but it seems like C C could. Um, it could be very complicated. It, it, it could be hard to craft, um, to Director Atchison's point. So if we left C open as an option, I'd suggest that that maybe have to come back to the board for approval um, so that we could kind of make sure it made sense. But for this time around, maybe we just stick with the uh, option A and B as uh, what we give people. Uh, Mr. Papstor. Thank you. I appreciate the feedback and the conversation. Um, I, I did want to note, I think it's important to know that Dr. Cox staff will be at all of your sub-regional forum meetings. And I think the Federal Highway Administration gave us sort of a medium length leash, but they did put us on a little bit of a leash as we go through this experiment. And it, it'll be incumbent on us to, to work with the sub-regional forums and give you a little kind of feedback if we think things are getting a little too far afield or, you know, kind of stretching the limits of that leash that we've all been provided by the Federal Highway Administration. So this will continue to be a dialogue as the sub-regional forums sort of individually discuss how they want to set their, their criteria. But this is helpful feedback on these options. Any other comments in the room or online or questions? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in the previous way of doing it, there, we did this, everything by category. So there were different types of, of projects that we could fund by category. Uh, and we recognized that CDOT, you know, and RTD and the big cities would have the projects that would probably have the most impact on the community. And in recognition of that, we sort of said, well, the small communities are going to have a really hard time um, meeting these exact same criteria. So there was a set aside that sort of gave small, a, a, part, a portion of the pool gave small c communities uh, a chance to sort of level the playing field and benefit. And I think that that was a really valuable piece of the old way of doing things because in a small community you might, like for example in Boulder County we have lions that you know people use their community to travel through to Rocky Mountain National Park, but for them to fund an improvement in there it would be a huge uh, percentage of their general fund or their capital projects fund. So it really helps identify and address projects like that that really are of a big impact to a small community's budget. And I do have a bit of concern using the regional share criteria as is that it will be very hard for small communities to compete 
And I, I sort of feel like what we've done is created a, a, an approach where we've cut CDOT and RTD out largely from being able to submit because we've made the regional pool so small. We've made the subregion sort of exclusive, and now if we're using these regional share criteria, my possible concern, which may be, you know, misplaced, but is that the larger cities really will benefit at each phase of this, which is good, and there are lots of good projects, but I think we may be missing the CDOT, the RTD, and the small communities uh, with this approach. So I'll, I'll just be watching for that and kind of uh, evaluating that as we go. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Mr. Papstorf, do you have your feedback or do you have any more I, to share? I do. I appreciate okay. that. So I'll move on to the next policy area. This is the subregional share application limits. Um, the purpose of this, so there is current, there is current, po current policy language in the TIP policy from the last uh, TIP cycle uh, that does set application limits by jurisdiction based on mainly population size of the jurisdiction. The purpose is really is to provide sort of a fair and balanced process for jurisdictions to compete for funding, um, but setting limits that uh, reflect sort of the amount of the money that's actually available uh, to be distributed uh, through the TIP process and really have an efficient scoring and review process. If we, if we didn't set any limit and any jurisdiction could submit as many projects as they wanted to, we could end up with a thousand applications to try to go through um, at the subregional level. That's probably not very efficient or effective for any of the subregional forums. Uh, we've also heard some feedback that some of the subregional forums may be asking Dr. Cogstaff to play a role in the scoring or review, technical review of project applications for the subregional share. Uh, so that plays into this as well. Uh, so the current policy outlines the maximum number allowed uh, per jurisdiction. Um, again, that's based on uh, mainly population. There was a table in the in your packet that showed what the current is. Um, if we, if we stick with something along those lines, we've discussed that one, we want to update the population information so that it's m most current information that we have that we're basing that distribution on. Uh, but also consider that you know, the, the sub-regional share of the pot is 80%, not 100% of the total amount of money. So maybe, there's, maybe that should be um, factored into what the limits are. There also would be have, to have, have, have to have a discussion about the city and county of Denver, which is its own sub-regional forum, as well as the city and county of Broomfield, which is, is its own sub-regional forum, and whether or not sort of the old limitations that were placed on them as two jurisdictions among many uh, competing regionally is, is still appropriate when they're really their own individual sub-regional forum um, and sort of competing against themselves for a piece of the, of the sub-regional share of projects. So option A would be uh, to kind of keep this policy in place, again, uh, providing that fair and balanced selection process. That's thunder. <laughs> I guess someone really likes that or doesn't like that option. <laughs> Um, option B would be to, to not limit the number of applications. We had an, an initial conversation with the TIP policy work group around that. Um, I think the, the general feedback was um, initially al allow the subregional forums to sort of set their own limits uh, within the subregional forum. Um, I think the caution that we have as Dr. Cox staff is again, if subregional forums are going to be asking us to play a role in the review, uh, either scoring or reviewing because you want sort of an independent third party to kind of do that part of your process for you and then and then you take that into consideration as you're formulating your recommendations. Um, there's a limit to sort of our ability to review applications and so we would want to have some reasonable sort of constraints around the total number. Uh, the other part of it is it's just it's not efficient, right, if you, if you have so many projects to choose from for this what is really a pretty limited pool pool of funds. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude and kind of throw that back to you. Director Henry. I have a couple of comments. One, Broomfield and Denver, you are so lucky, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I, I appreciate, you know, the Dr. Cog staff pushing back, but I, I kind of agree that the subregion should be allowed to decide um, on what they can handle. Um, themselves, and if they choose to include Dr. Cog's staff and helping them, you know, look over the the applications, then maybe you know they can have that conversation with Dr. Cog. But I honestly feel that the subregions should be allowed to make that decision for themselves. As a mother, um, I remember one of the toughest things to do was to let my children go and you know be you know prosper. 
So I, I'm, I'm asking the Dr. Cog staff to let us go and prosper. Um, I know you want to mother us, but it also ends up to be smothering us. So thank you for that. Uh, Director Jones. Um, I, I tend to agree that maybe the subregions should decide on the submittals because it's really going to vary f uh, dramatically from subregion to subregion. If you don't have very much money, you're not going to, you know, maybe you know already that you just want to sink all of your money in one or two projects. So that's, and, and then other subregions that might be very different. I think maybe where the limit should be is how many a subregion could submit to Dr. Cog for analysis because you have a finite staff. So I don't know if that's 10 projects, but I, I could very much see relying on Dr. Cog's staff to do the analysis for large projects, you know, capacity and, and, and major operations projects. And then I think it's fair for, for us to come up with some limit that feels reasonable. So, but that's where I would put it. Otherwise, I think the subregions could figure that out for themselves. Director Teal. Okay, stop reading my notes. It's getting annoying. <laughs> <laughs> so what she said, no, and, and what Eva said, uh, no, I think uh, I, I do, I do very much think that we, uh, it is would be a fine for Dr. Cog's staff to establish what is the maximum number for analysis to get that additional analysis. I think that's fully reasonable, um, but uh, maybe we're fortunate in Douglas County. We don't have a, a very large membership. I think we're talking eight entities that we're bringing in on the subregion. So, um, yeah, I would hesitate to try to set an upper limit uh, per subregional that that they would that the subregionals would go through the analysis with. Thank you, Director Shaw. <clears throat> Thanks. I would I would say don't limit the subregions, but uh, to the number of of applications. However, um, you could use what was in the packet as a guideline of the maximum that Dr. Cog would review. Then you've then you've got your limitations on workload and say if it's Douglas County, we'll take your top seven projects or fewer. Director Finham. Nope, you're good. D uh, Director Rakowski. I would very much support Commissioner Henry. And as a practical matter, having had the Praetorian Guard of Dr. Cog at all of the Arapahoe County sub meetings, of which there have been many, they have been very active participants in the discussion. In fact, one almost had to restrain them at times. <laughs> so these things aren't going to get out of control. Dr. Cog is there. Uh, I had, we had, what, four or five Dr. Cog members at our last meeting. Uh, so I'm convinced that they're going to take care of themselves and they're not going to get overwhelmed. But I don't see a point in a limit. Let's be creative. Uh, Director uh, Fanganello. <coughs> I just can't miss out on a moment for kumbaya. Like, this is awesome. So I'm just going to chime in on where we are. I think it's, it's a good place to be. Any other questions or comments? Any online? All right, next. Thank you. Last one, and this is, this is uh, we'll admit, a little tricky. So this deals with project delay and consequences for project delay. So if you, were, if you, you may recall that in the current TIP policy, uh, this is a policy that was um, set back in 2015. Um, the purpose of this is to encourage project sponsors that are awarded TIP funds to move their projects ahead on the schedule that they've agreed to. Um, delayed projects can tie up these limited amount, these scarce sources of funds. Um, from projects that could have otherwise used them. And, and we do get negative feedback from our federal partners and our state partners if these federal funds aren't obligated and sit out there unobligated and, and unused. So, there, so this is an incentive to our project, spar, project sponsor partners to, to keep their projects on schedule as much as possible. So the current policy uh, reduces by 20% the maximum number of applications a sponsor can submit in the next TIP call for projects. Now, as we just discussed, if there are no limits on the number of projects that a jurisdiction can submit, then this 
consequence has no meaning. And so we've talked about some, uh, an alternative consequence um, that would be to, you know, instead of keeping that policy or some form of that policy in place, to require an increase in the local match requirement for that project sponsor's projects, all of their projects that they submit in that call for projects, from the minimum 20% to some increased amount to be determined. And uh, we've kicked around that could be 25%, it could be 30%, but something that is gonna be meaningful and, have, and be some meaningful consequence for those project sponsors that have a project that gets into a second year delay situation. So um, I don't know that I need to say a lot more about that unless you have specific questions about sort of the current policy and, and kind of why we have the, the consequence built into the TIP policy. Director Henry. <clears throat> I have a real quick and hopefully easy question. What if the delay is due to RTD or CDOT? Because that has happened. It is. I, I, will, I will simply say this, that under the existing policy, it doesn't matter. It, if it's delayed, it's delayed. Um, so even now, though it's out of the jurisdictions, then they're the ones that actually have to get penalized, not CDOT or RTD. Under the current policy, that's correct. I really don't think that's fair. No. Let me ask the question, did they come back to us when they did delay? Don't they come see the board, or is that who, the other process? Does? Well, if there's a delay, don't we have to ask for an extension? Yes. Sure. Should so the board have the ability to say the penalty should or should not apply? We should say there's a standard, but shouldn't the board make the final decision if a penalty should be applied? Yeah. Sure. And again, it has in the past. You know, for first year delays, we bring a report to you all, basically explaining you know what the process would be to get that project back on track. And um, you know, typically, you know, our staff recommendation is to let it proceed, and, and you guys haven't had an issue with that. The second year delay is a little more complicated in that um, if if the year project is second year delayed, you th they come in and appeal to the board, and you can offer up to 120 days extension of that project. We did, you know, back when we discussed this delay policy three years or so ago, um, we did talk about the actual CDOT RTD component of this and we never reached any resolution, but that is something we can definitely have a conversation about again. Director Crispin. Um, I'm assuming that the increase in the match is to submissions in the next tip well, that could be fairly draconian. So let's say Aurora was putting in a trail, and it's a $4 million trail, and it gets delayed. Well, next tip thing, they're trying to do a you know $50 million project, and that's a, I mean, that's a, a really an unfair um, penalty for a small project. That's that's all I would have to say. Well, I, yeah, I don't disagree. I, I you know, we've uh, we've struggled with this to try to find something that would be appropriate, right? Um, you know, even last time, you know, we came up with minimizing the number of projects um, that that. Uh, that any one entity can submit, which I, I thought made sense, and you know that, of course, you know here we are changing the the, the process for which we uh, select projects, so it doesn't really work anymore. Um, but if anybody else has any any other ideas about how we might um, you know provide some kind of delay penalty, we'd be all open for this. My my concern with this one is uh, simply that you know as part of um, some of the sub-regional discussions right now as far as additional criteria or additional weighting. There has been some discussion about, um, uh, you know, having as a minimum a higher match than what is currently proposed. So 20% is the minimum, right, for federal funds. Um, there are those communities, those sub-regions that at least have a conversation about increasing that minimum match to something else. So how does you know, this necessarily wouldn't wouldn't work if, if that's the case. If they if they have a, a match that's higher, or maybe it's just you know it's X percent above and beyond what the minimum is for that subregion, or something like that. But that you know kind of gets out of hand. Director Atchison. You know, going back to uh, Commissioner Henry's comment, is 
one of the things that we've been able to work out most of the time with RTD and Doc and CDOT is we've been able to negate some of those delays through conversations with them through the local. The ones that we have not been able to do that with is Burlington Northern or mm -hmm. Union Pacific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so we may be able to resolve in the second year delays by one of our current partners, but those who are outside that partnership, like the railroad, we don't have a lot of negotiating effort with them because we don't have any funds that we ever give to them we, other than when we pay them to do something at an exorbitant cost and a long period of time. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to also consider the point that what's the reaction of when we look at someone who submitted a project, if they're into the second year delay, what's the cause of the delay? What mitigation have they done to reduce that delay? And do they have a history of it? If this is something that's common to them, then we should take a more appropriate action saying, look, you need to start managing your projects. If you can't do that, we'll help you by not giving you any more projects until you can show that the ones you currently have, you can manage. Those are all options I think we have on the table. I don't think, as uh, Doug talked about, I don't think there's a magic bullet on what you do on a penalty, but I think you have to assess each one on a case-by-case -case basis because there could be circumstances outside the control of the convening authority. And when they do that, let's try to work with the issue, but let's not make a hard, fast rule that we have no ability to do anything with them, but leave some flexibility in there for us. So let's, let's try to work out something that's going to be beneficial to all. I have uh, Elrod Brockett and Stolzman, so Director Elrod. Thank you. Um, so what I like about Option B is, I mean, as, as difficult that would be to swallow that pill, um, Time is money, and it's a missed opportunity. So I, I would support that. Um, what I would like to understand, because I wasn't aware that this applies to the next project, is there a mechanism where this increase would um, be on the current project and those funds go back into a pot? Is there a mechanism for that to happen? Mr. Mr. Go, Chair, go ahead. Director Alra, there, there actually are sort of penalties in the, in the TIP for projects that don't resolve a second year delay. So the board, the board can basically put any further funding for that project on hold or cancel funding for that project if a project sponsor hasn't, hasn't been able to successfully resolve a second year delay at all. So I think that would be more equitable and aligned to that particular project as opposed to penalizing a, a subsequent project. Well, yeah, I, you know, I like that. I, I was actually thinking as the director Atchison was talking that, um, you know, we were having the conversation primarily around the penalty of, right? What if we never got to that point, right? What if um, we were more proactive in our policy about stating, um, you know, and checking in probably more, more uh, frequently with the actual um, sponsor? And then, you know what, if they, can, if they can't get, if they're second year delayed, then they just lose the money. You know, at that point, if they're, they're at fault for, for not being able to, um, to uh, complete that project or get to the required phase, then maybe they should have to, have to, have to revoke that funding. Maybe that's it, right, as opposed to trying to work on, you know, something in the future as far as a penalty. Mm -hmm. Something to think about. Director Brockett. Yeah, Director Elrod beat me to it. I was going to suggest the same thing because you know you're talking about a year's delay for this penalty for the next tip cycle, and then the earlier point about it could be a ten times larger project, and you, the penalty could be really disproportionate. But I think if we follow Director Atchison's approach of making sure that we look at the individual particulars of each project delay, having the penalty come with this project, the very one that you're not being able to get done, makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Director uh, Solzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just backing up a, a little bit to a higher level. So I've been uh, an advocate for having some kind of penalty in place because there are lots of projects that submitted that were shovel ready that didn't get chosen. And we're all experiencing a tremendous amount of construction inflation, and that's impacting our cities and our counties. So there is an equity issue for communities who have these second-year delays where, you know, you're taking multiple years on 
potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars that the rest of us could have happily been spending and, and avoiding additional increased costs by having to delay our projects. So I do favor having some kind of consequence if there are long delays on projects because other, other communities could have used those funds. So I do take it very seriously. Um, I'm, I'm sort of disappointed with the options in front of us because I think there are major equity issues with each uh, option. And um, it's, it's disappointing. Um, I even, you know, you sort of call out Denver and Broomfield in that option A issue. Even in other communities there are issues because if you had, let's say you had five communities in one subregion that had delays, you do still have a disproportionate benefit that you shouldn't be having. Um, so anyway, there are problems with option A, there are problems with option B. And I, I even think this option that's been presented tonight, um, if we pencil it all out, has some issues with how uh, funds are appropriated by our different cities and counties on a fiscal year, and that you wouldn't necessarily have funds appropriated to backfill on a second year delay. And so it could cause a project that could come that could come to completion on the second year to delay to totally fail and waste even more public funds. So. I'm sort of disappointed about where we are, but I am in favor of keeping some kind of consequence on projects that have delays. I just don't see any of these as being an acceptable option. Yes, Director Fanganella. I guess as a, a question for staff is, you know, we've been looking at Puget Sound as a model, and is there anything there that they've offered or nothing that they're doing? Just curious. Nothing? No. Todd, you might chime in. I'm, I'm not aware. Uh, I'm trying to recall this from memory, so don't shoot me if I got it wrong, but I believe theirs is a little bit more strict where they do have, after the first year of delay, they have some sort of warning, and they're given essentially six months to complete or initiate a phase or do something, and if they don't meet that six-month deadline, their funding is revoked. So their penalty is tied to the project that experiences delay, not a forward-looking penalty on future project applications correct which is I haven't done a full scan but I, I suspect that that's probably pretty generally adopted um, policy for a lot of MPOs around the country director Dell yes uh, I need some clarification we keep talking about year delays but what is the requirement for reporting the status of a project is it quarterly is it so I mean if, if it was more frequent it'd be bureaucratic but it might say well we don't have these we could push the envelope a little more if there's re increased reporting requirement and a low bid for me to want to have more bureaucracy but mr. chair I'll have Todd address that specifically so dr. Cog uh, staff checks in with both CDOT and RTD twice a year, um, usually on right around April 1st. Um, this is more of an informal that doesn't necessarily go out um, to our committees and board. It just kind of gives Dr. Cog staff information where we can check in with sponsors to make sure things are, are going smoothly or if they're not, um, perhaps give them a little bit more push or assistance. Um, our official check-in is October 1st of every year. And the information that we collect at that time um, will go into our report that you will see usually approximately three to four months later. Director Jones. Um, just to weigh in on, I, I think whatever penalty we have should go with the project because usually it's either a shortcoming in that project that's providing an obstacle or something happening with the jurisdiction at that particular moment in time. And none of those things would necessarily apply to the next TIP cycle and could be disproportionate, as Director Brockett mentioned. I'm also curious, what is the universe of how often do we find ourselves wanting to penalize communities? Because we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to get people, but is it, how often does it happen? Yeah. I can't remember. So, Mr. Mr. Chair, Director, um, I believe that since this policy went into place in 2015, there have been one, two, seven projects that have gone into second year delay. I think the question is out of how many. Do you know? I don't. I, I do not know. It's the projects that were funded last time. Yeah, there were forty. There were forty-six projects that were funded in the last tip cycle, um, but some of them would have been from the cycle before that as well. Todd. Yeah. Uh, it's a rather 
high percentage. I, I mean, just off the top of my head, probably less than 5% of the projects actually achieve a second year delay. That's not so, very many. So the seven was the first year and then the second year is less? Is no, so for example, in, in 15, in 2015 there was three, in 2016 there was just one, and then just last year there was three. So it can greatly vary, it just depends on all the circumstances. It's, it's hard to predict whether we're gonna have you know, none or four or five. It, it would be interesting if we had a root cause on those. So we, I think that gets back into, is it BNSF or is it CDOT, is it, you know, who's causing it? It could be Denver Water, all we know. Um, but, <laughs> but there's a lot of external sources that could cause that. So I, I think it would be interesting for, I think, the board to know out of those, what caused it? Was it self-inflicted or was it outside sources, you know? Um, and is there any other questions, comments? I, I just want to, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I'm just going to make a comment that I agree with uh, Director Stolzman that, you know, one of the things I had a concern with is when we delay these projects, it does rob some of the other communities that missed out. And there has to be some sort of penalty. Um, I don't think we're trying to get at somebody. We just think it's unfair when we talk about equity and, and being fair with all the other communities. Other communities could have had a shovel ready and could have met those dates. So I, I just want to echo the same concerns, and I agree uh, with that. Any other comments or questions? Any online? Yes, Director uh, Maurer. Yeah, I agree with um, having the penalties in place, but I don't believe there's been penalties in the past. And so I think this is a great way to kind of get people used to, you know, meeting those deadlines. Yeah. I, I, think, I think if we, our experience was coming here and kind of justifying your delays caused, you know, some, some improvement. But um, <laughs> Shaming. Yeah, you know, and but I think, but I think it all let us. I think let the board of directors have an appreciation for the community struggles and so forth. So I mean, uh, it gives us some empathy with the situation because I believe a few of them did pop up. Uh, Mr. Rukowski had one. We had, I think, Wheat Ridge had the big Wadsworth widening. I think was one, and those are very huge regional impacted uh, projects. Um, so, you know, I I think. There should be an appeal process, if I was to add anything. Uh, I, we didn't really talk about that, but if we were to do a hard line, like saying you're going to lose your funding, uh, we should have maybe an appeals process to the board uh, still there. Yes, Director Henry. One of the things I think we need to consider is if they lose their funding, are they going to have to pay back the money that's already been spent on the project? Yes, they do. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Mr. Ron. Chair, I, I really appreciate your thoughts. We can we can look at sort of and explore some of the root causes of some of those some of those delays as much as we can ascertain yeah. on those project on those seven projects that have experienced second year delays. Um, we knew that this is a this is a tough subject, which is why we wanted to start this conversation to give us time to kind of wrestle through. Um, Apologize to Dr. St or to Director Stolzman that we missed the mark. I, th I think we we knew we've been struggling with this. Um, I wanted you to be hopeful that we could find a find a solution. Um, and but we'll take this feedback uh, back and 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 try to find something that kind of addresses some of these issues. Um, Director Atchison's comments about looking at you know kind of repeat offenders isn't quite the right word, but if there's a jurisdiction that seems to have a history of, of struggling with, with moving their projects forward, trying to kind of find out uh, what's causing that, if that, if that should be a factor in evaluating these, um, reviewing the causes of the delays, whether that's sort of an underestimation by the project sponsor of the difficulties of right of way or really didn't understand sort of the utility conflicts that might, that might exist that maybe they should have understood uh, before they submitted the project for, for funding, sort of those readiness issues that sometimes I think some jurisdictions can, can underestimate sometimes in their zeal to, to try to get, these, get access to these limited funds for, for very important projects. I uh, don't want don't to miss that point. So we will continue to work on this. We'll, we'll take that back to the, to the TIP policy work group and continue to ruminate on this a bit and um, hopefully come back with something that you all feel a little more comfortable with. Director Teal. Just one piece I'd ask, excuse me, to have added, you know, the root cause analysis, great, but then the follow-up on status of resolution. Because um, if I recall the three that we talked about in December, um, two of them, by the time it came to the board, were resolved. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And so, and, and one of those was a Castle Rock one, and we just had to go find a contractor to get back on track. So, so if that could be a part of that analysis, yes, root cause, but then what is the status of that resolution? I think that could probably give us all the feeling that the, the poking, the, uh, the official check-in in October uh, probably does do its job um, in, in terms of getting things moved along. Correct. Doug? I'll just mention real quick, of those seven um, that have been uh, second year delayed, and were, they were all granted the 120 days extension, and all those projects were able to get back on phase or complete it during, during that time frame. So we haven't gotten to a point where the the grandest of penalties was, was cast upon them that they had to uh, return the funds. Right. So thankfully, that, that's the case. Maybe just coming to the principal's office is all they need. <laughs> Director Jones. But all of those seven communities would incur this penalty, right? Correct. So if we solve it by poking, to use Director Teal's work, then let's just move up the poking six months, <laughs> get it done, and we don't have to penalize people. Right? It's the poking is obviously 100% successful. Right. Poke earlier. <laughs> or do they have a hearing first? They come here and before the penalty is applied. I, right? Could it, I mean, it, it shouldn't see penalty, then appeal. Maybe it should be come and talk to us first uh, and then, then make the decision. I don't know. But we are focused more on the penalty as opposed to moving the money quickly, which is really the end goal. So we might solve this problem by changing our emphasis. Sounds good. Any other questions or comments? Do you have more? Mr. Mr. Chair, just, just to delve into that a little bit, Director, um, are you meaning maybe at, if, if a project gets to one year delay, then maybe we treat that more like we currently treat the second year delay projects? Bring them in front of the board, explain why, have a, have a plan for addressing and getting out of the one year delay. Is that, am I interpreting your comment yeah. correctly? either at the 12 month mark or the 18 month mark wherever so that they can resolve it before the magic two years has passed thank you thank you anything else Ron no you got all your Chair, feedback appreciate from. that yes okay. thank you very much um, real quick before we leave just I s director Atchison do you want to give us an update from the hill I think you guys were up there do you want to share anything I think I don't know d pleasure quickly we make it quickly well uh, on behalf of uh, Director Stolten, I, I apologize for its being late, but we waited three hours in order to get three minutes. Mm. And uh, the Metro Mirrors was behind us. They had not testified either. Uh, the sponsor of the bill in the House, uh, Representative Buck, offered seven amendments to her own bill. The uh, chair brought in an outline for an amendment without the details in it, which she offered as well. Testimony was going to be cut off at 5.30 because they had to go back to the floor. I cannot tell you that they finished by 5.30. Um, I've been trying to watch for updates coming from the lobbies that uh, our city has over there, and there's been nothing come out. So this thing could not have gone to a vote as a possibility tonight. And they have to deal with all seven of the sponsors' amendments, plus deal with what the chair has outlined would be an amendment, which isn't even written. Testimony across the board is just that. It's across the board. There is no final decision. Uh, I appreciate uh, Ashley sticking with us, and I know we had staff over there. In fact, uh, Rich Morrow, I think, is still over there. So evidently, they didn't come to a decision, or Rich would couldn't come running back over here saying, we got to vote, we got to vote. Uh, I don't think there's a conclusion. I think this is, at best, it may go back to the Senate. Uh, there are some very definite opinions over there on issues dealing with bonding, revenue, and what will or won't be applied for multimodal or local match. This is SB1, correct. Uh, 1340 is still out there on the orbital bill status, and there's still recommendations to delay any kind of uh, legislative push for a bill in 18 to push it out to 19 to wait to see what the business world is talking about the coalition which is still trying to figure out which of the five titles they're going to go forward with 
Unfortunately, I don't have a solid answer uh, because they don't have one. Thank you. Uh, Director Jones. I would just add, I testified after um, Herb did, so I was even later. Sorry about that. Um, it, what it looked like was the folks that were testifying with me, the Democrats had reached a consensus around Chairman Winter's amendment that it didn't, it, that it provided the balance between transportation funding and funding for K-12 and human services. That seemed to be pl uh, splitting the Democratic caucus. So my guess is that the Democrats will align behind Chairman Winter's, Chairwoman Winter's proposal. Um, how they resolve that with the Senate or if they can, no idea. But at least that piece, that was the goal, I think, of the Winter Amendment. And it it seemed to have accomplished that based on folks actually testifying in support yeah, and, of it. And we've had a lot of a lot of conversation over the last, Doug, 10 days and a number of meetings back and forth with the chair of the transportation on the House side, uh, Representative Winters. We've been trying to work this, and I will tell you, at 10 o'clock last night, a different deal was struck, which then pulled the chamber sort of out of the deal that we had at 1 o'clock yesterday afternoon. And this morning, again, deals were being struck, as uh, Commissioner Jones is talking about. If the speaker prevails, if the chair prevails, she at least has the speaker's back and the governor's, because those three, along with others that have been working on this, are, I think, somewhat aligned. Unfortunately, I'm not sure the Senate is. And that's where the big thing, we, we could end up just like we were last year, short a vote. But uh, this is something that will continue to be watched. Doug and the staff are prepared to send out something to the entire board based upon the direction that the board gave the officers. And as soon as we know a resolution of some kind that we think is viable, we'll get that out to you. Thank you. And thank you for uh, going to the... Uh Capitol and advocating for us. One last thing before we adjourn, I want to recognize Director Fanganello. I believe this may be your last Dr. Cog meeting. But for now, I'd like to recognize you for your thoughtful leadership in the region as well for the city and county of Denver. And we've always appreciated your presence here at the meetings. So thank you very much. If there's no other questions, we stand adjourned.